official members bounce Bust off the chrome Realize it's real hell where we call home Official members bounce Bust off the chrome Realize it's real hell where we call home From the heart inside one I vision fat licks and mat clips The chrome will make the average imitator do backflips You lack a pistol So put a vest around the issue Sluts will never miss you Coming from members that's official You know what sucks? Botching the recording uh, third time this semester for the lecture and of course I gotta re-record it, but I can't go back to the campus because you have to tell your PO we're gonna go first and you have to approve it before you can go anywhere. So I figured it's Monday night, let me go ahead and record, re-record what we talked about today. So the last class we were talking about the, the introduction to concurrent control, and we spent most of our time talking about acid, atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. And we spent most of our time discussing isolation, and in particular we were talking about how we wanna have the system, the data system be able to run transactions as if they were running uh, one after another in serial order. But of course, then we, we still want to be there and leave them to allow for better parallelism to get better performance in, in our system. And so we had this notion of this idea of, of serializable schedules, where one where the outcome of the database is as if the transactions were executing in serial order, even though they were being interleaved. And so we talked about these two types of serializability or serializable schedules. We talked about conflict serializable and view serializable. A conflict serializable is one where we said that the, we have this dependency graph, and if we could recognize that, that were, there were no cycles in the dependency graph, where operations were occurring between, one, you know, between different transactions on the same object in, in different orders, then we know that the, that schedule would, would be equivalent to a, a serial ordering. And then we said there was this other notion of uh, serializability called view serializable, where this is allows for additional uh, uh, schedules that you couldn't do otherwise in conflict serializable because conflict serializable is trying to be a bit conservative in, in how it schedules transactions. But in order to make this work, you had to have some higher level meaning or understand the semantics of what applications uh, thought or cared about the data to identify that, yeah, you could reorder things a certain way. Right? The example we showed that you could do a blind write on, uh, on, a, on an object where you don't care about the interleavings with the transactions before then, as long as the last transaction is successfully written to that, that the one object at the end. Of course, as you said, this, in order to do this, you either have to do static analysis or program analysis on the application code, or do the worst thing possible, which is talk to a human, uh, which is a non-starter for database systems. So in that case, you know, for that reason, no, no database system is going to support this. So when you say, I want serializable transactions in a database system, you typically, you're always, you're always going to get serializable isolation. So last class, though, was looking at what we called static schedules, meaning where the, the, all the operations for, the, for transactions were known to the database system ahead of time. So all the reads and writes we would, we would declare ahead of time, and therefore we could then decide how to interleave them to determine whether we could produce something that was conflict serializable. Um, and of course now, as we said, in a, in a real system, uh, most systems don't work that way. You have all the transactions operations ahead of time. There are some systems that can do this, and if you store procedures, you can potentially do this as well, uh, but most systems don't work like that. Right? And so instead, we have this uh, sort of fog of war, if you will, where transactions are submitting query requests, they're requesting to do some operations on some objects in the database, and the database system has to figure out on the fly as it goes along in the, you know, who, what operation from what transactions is allowed to touch what data at what time and in what order. And again, to, to ultimately end up with a uh, execution schedule for transactions, even though they're dynamically coming in, um, to be end up with a state of the database that'd be equivalent to one where we executed them in, in serial order. So we didn't be able to, again, the idea is we would able to figure this out on the fly without knowing the schedules ahead of time. So in today's class, the solution we're gonna look at how to do this is, is through locks. And then next class on Wednesday, we'll see how to do this with timestamps, so it's a different approach to trying to solve the same problem. So if you recall back to the beginning of the semester, uh, when we talked about index concurrent control and the buffer manager, and we talked about latches, the, the, the protection mechanisms we would have inside our data system to protect the critical sections of, uh, of, the, of the internals of the system. And I sort of was being very hand wavy and say, oh yeah, there's this other thing called locks that if you, in the OS world, then when, when we say latch, they, what they really mean is a lock. But in our world, locks are something different because they're, they're a high level construct. So now today we're at the point where now we need, it's time to talk about how we're gonna use locks to protect transactions. So again, going back to this table that we had from the Gertz Graphy guy, um, these locks now are being defined on 
to, to separate transactions from each other based on the contents of the database. So it's no longer low level things like a node in a B plus tree or a pointer if you want to swap something out, like in a linked list, for example. Um, now it's protecting objects in the database. So a database, a table, uh, tuples, attributes, and so, and so forth. And they're going to potentially hold these locks during the lifetime of a transaction. So I could acquire a lock and hold it for the, for the du that entire duration, that, as long as that transaction lives. And then I go ahead and release it. Whereas like the latches, remember we were saying it's supposed to be for a, a, a small amount of time to come in, get a, you know, a latch on something, do some operation, and then immediately go ahead and release it. There was two types of modes for, for latches. There was just uh, read and write. Now in locks, we're going to first start off with just two modes. Uh, shared and exclusive, right? Shared just means read, write, or exclusive just means write. We're just trying not to use the same term. Um, but then there's also going to be these additional locks, we, we, uh, modes we're going to have later on when we talk at the end of the semester or end of the, the lecture about hierarchical locking. That's going to make our things, make the life even more complicated as well. But these are going to be special locks we can have for, for different contexts to explain to other transactions what we're trying to do in different parts of the system. In latches, we, we had to write our code uh, in a correct manner to avoid deadlocks. Uh, but again, if we try to acquire a latch and it wasn't available, we said we'd just shoot ourselves in the head immediately and give it back up. But now with locks uh, at, on transactions, we are going to have additional protocols that are going to handle uh, deadlocks within the system itself. Because again, it's going to be some, some random JavaScript programmer sending you crappy queries, and they may incur a deadlock. And so we, as the database system people building, building it, we have to protect them from themselves, from shooting themselves in the foot. And so we're going to have this higher level uh, concurrent mechanism, a traffic coordinator or a transaction coordinator, if you will, that can determine that oh, there's a deadlock and we go ahead and, and, and break it. Or in some cases, to order the operation of request for, for locks in such a way that we never had deadlocks to begin with. And then the other key thing about the, the, the locks um, is that instead of having them being maintained inside of the data structure themselves, so remember like in the B plus tree, the latches were in the nodes themselves. We're now going to have this centralized uh, component in our data system called the transaction manager or the lock manager, where it's essentially a, a hash table that can keep track of what locks exist, who holds them in what mode, and then a priority queues or queues to keep track of who's waiting, what other transactions are waiting to acquire that lock. And so this is going to be a much more expensive and heavy machinery in to, to maintain this lock information versus the latching with to be more lightweight. But the reason why we want to have the, this heavyweight lock manager is that we want to, since since the the, the since the duration that transactions be holding locks, it's okay for us to pay this penalty to keep track of all the locks in the centralized location because now we have a, a complete global view what all the transactions that are running in our system, assuming it's a single node, distributed database will make that harder for us later on. But now we can at least see everything that's going on in the system so we can make better decisions about how to, how to deal with uh, conflicts or issues that come up. Because right? that'll allow us to get better parallelism if we do it this way. All right, so let's go back now to a really simple example that schedules that we showed before. And we have T1, T2. T1 wants to read on A, write on A, read on A. T2 wants to do a read on A followed by a write on A. But now we're going to introduce these explicit lock and unlock commands in our transaction schedules. So T1 starts off, the first thing it's going to do is, before it can do any, any look up on A or write on A, it's got to go to the lock manager and say, I want the lock on A because I want to do something with it. And then the lock manager keeps track of you know, who holds the locks on A, if, if any transaction write does right now. And in this example here, nobody holds the lock, so it's allowed to grant the lock request to A, and now A acquires that lock. So then it can go ahead and execute and uh, do the read on, read on A. And then now there's a context switch, T2 starts running, and the first thing it wants to do is request the lock on A. So now in this case here, since T1 already holds the lock, uh, the lock manager would recognize that, T, that that lock on A is already being held, and therefore it denies the request, and essentially puts the, the, the thread uh, the worker running T2, the T2 re request has to go into the, the queue for that lock, and it just has to stall and wait. Then T1 can switch back, now do the write on A, read on A, and then at which point it releases the lock on A um, while T2 is sleeping, and then that request goes back to the lock manager, it releases the lock, it's allowed to go ahead and commit later on, but at this point when the lock is released on A, then that uh, wakes up 
T2 and the T2 can get the, the, the lock request, and do the read and do the write, right? So at a high level, this is what we're talking about today is how to design a protocol based on these sort of a lock and unlock commands to generate schedules of transactions that end up in a uh, serializable ordering. I will say also too that transactions typically don't make explicit requests for lock and unlock. This sort of happens automatically. If I run a select query, for example, then I'll acquire like the share lock on it first, the, the write lock on it, or relock on it first. And that's not something the programmer has to write explicitly. The data system will do this for you. And likewise, we'll see later on when you do uh, commit, uh, it could go ahead and unlock things. But I first want to understand how the protocol works today. And then as we go along, we then see, okay, how can you actually do this uh, automatically in a real system? So today I want to first talk about the, the different lock types that, are, that, that can exist. Again, the basic lock types, and then we'll expand them later on when we talk about hierarchical locking uh, at the bottom. Then we'll talk about the, the basic two-phase uh, locking protocol, basically understand how that works. Then we'll see how it'll strengthen it even further to avoid additional problems may occur uh, later on. And then we'll talk about how to deal with deadlocks and preventions in, in different, different ways. And again, as I said, we'll finish up with hierarchical locking as a way to uh, be more efficient in a lock manager by taking locks on regions of objects rather than single objects at a time. All right, so uh, again, in the, the, for the basic locks, uh, we're going to have shared locks and exclusive locks. Again, shared locks are for reads, exclusive locks are writes. And the compatibility matrix here basically looks like, like it did for read and write latches, where if someone has a read latch or sorry, shared lock, uh, somebody else can acquire also a shared lock on that same object but anything else is incompatible. So if I, someone holds a shared lock, I can't get a write lock. Someone holds a shared lock, I can't get an exclusive lock. If someone holds an exclusive lock, I can't get any other lock. So again, for simplicity, I'm sharing just starting off with these two lock types. As, I'm, as a preview of what's coming later on, uh, you can just see from the manuals of real database systems, there's a whole, their compatibility metrics are much, much larger because there's a bunch of different, uh, bunch of different uh, lock types you can have. Uh, and for different types of objects, like catalog for the t updating tables for, for catalog updates versus doing index updates, there's a whole bunch of different variations on this. So again, the, it's good to understand the basics of two-phase locking, and then we'll see how to make it uh, more robust later on. Okay, so how is this working with locks? So the basic way we're going to do this is transactions, before they can do any operation on, a, on an object, like a read or write, they have to go acquire the lock from the lock manager uh, for that for that given object, you can do lock upgrades. Meaning, if I hold the the object in, in a share lock, I hold the share lock on an object, and I know the next very th very next thing I want to do is do a write on it. I can then say I already hold a share lock, upgrade it to an exclusive lock, and that might be possible to go ahead and do. Uh, otherwise, you, you may have to may have to stall. And the lock manager is is responsible for figuring out who holds what locks. Uh, in what mode, and then who's waiting for those locks in uh, in what modes as well. Then as transactions finish with, with what they, uh, whatever operation they want to do, they go ahead and release locks. So the lock manager is typically implemented as a, as a hash table. Uh, in some systems like Postgres, you can query it as if it's a real table, but I think it's just a, it's just a view over a function um, that accesses the internal data structure. Because right? we don't need all the things that we've been talking about before, like the, well, you don't need transactions on, on the lock table because then you need a lock table to have our transactions. So how would you, how could you do that? But you still need to protect the data structure with latches. Um, and you know, when we we'll talk about logging, you don't need to save the lock table to disk because it doesn't make sense if you crash and come back. Uh, who cares what locks are being held because those transactions are gone anyway, right? So it's sort of a special case of a kind of table that isn't doesn't fall under the same protection mechanisms as a regular data table. All right. So if we go back to our example here, and now we're going to introduce the the same setup as before, but now we're going to do use the different lock modes for our, our transactions. So T1 first gets the exclusive lock on A, uh, then does the read on A followed by the write on A. Now we could have gotten the share lock on A first, do the read, and then upgrade it to an exclusive lock and then do the write. But for simplicity to make it fit in the slides, I'm just doing it as a you know, single exclusive lock acquisition. And we'll, we'll see how to do that in SQL uh, at the end of the lecture. Then after T1 has finished the first write, It'll go ahead and release the lock on A, all right? Because there's a context switch. T2 is going to start running. So yeah, let me go ahead and give up the lock. T2 starts running. It gets the exclusive lock on A. Then it does the write on A. And then it says, oh, I'm done, and releases the, the, that lock back on, on A. But now T1 starts running again. And it gets the share lock on A, goes ahead and reads it, and then unlocks it. 
But the problem is that in this example here, T, T1 is going to read the, the write made by T2 when it should have seen the, 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 the write that it did earlier. Right? So this was, this was an unrepeatable read anomaly that, that we saw before. We're, we're reading things multiple times and we're not seeing the same values. Right? So this, the main th takeaway here is that just because we're doing, using locks doesn't mean we're gonna, we can guarantee that we're gonna, you know, always going to get a, a serializable ordering of, of schedules or transactions. Right? So we want to be smart about how we lock things and unlock things to avoid anomalies like this. And this is what two-phase locking does for us. So two-phase locking is going to be a contrarian protocol that we're going to use that's going to determine or, or, or dictate at which point uh, how we acquire locks and then what happens when we actually start want to go ahead and, re and release them. And this was, one, this was the first provably uh, correct concurrency protocol from the 1970s uh, that could generate uh, serializable ordering of, of transactions without having to know all the, the, the queries ahead of time. And this was invented by Jim Gray at IBM working on System R, which he later won the Turing Award for this in, uh, in the 1990s. So two-phase locking is, as it sounds, it has two phases. So in the first case, phase called the, the growing phase, the transactions are allowed to, to keep requesting as many locks as they want, uh, and then the lock manager can just grant or deny them uh, as, as it normally would. But then as soon as a transaction releases a lock, then we automatically switch into the shrinking phase. Now, at this point here, when you're in the shrinking phase, you can never go back, the transaction can never go back and acquire new locks. It can only release locks or it commits and releases all the locks that, that it has. Right? And so again, this is the key idea that, that and it's sort of avoid that problem we saw before because it unlocked the A and then it tried to acquire another lock. That wouldn't be allowed in two phase locking because you can't go back and acquire locks once you, once you unlock something. So the way, another way to think about this is that the, we think about the lifetime of the transaction over time for a single transaction. And along the, the x-axis here, we're showing the, the number of locks that it's accumulating over time. So in the growing phase, you're acquiring lock, 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 lock. You're getting all the locks that, that you want. And then at some point, you say, all right, well, that's enough. I have enough locks. And you go ahead and release them. Then you, again, automatically sh sh uh, uh, switch into the shrinking phase where you're just returning locks back to the, the transaction manager. So the way you sort of think about this is like you're climbing up the mountain acquiring locks, then at some point you reach the peak and now you're going down the other side and you never come back to another peak. Meaning like I can't release some locks and then go acquire more locks because right? this would be a 2PL violation and, and you can't, we can't allow this. Right? And if we at least guarantee this, then we can, we can, we can show that we're always going to be able to generate uh, you know, conflict serializable schedules. All right, so let's go back to our example before. So T1 starts, gets exclusive lock on A, it, that gets granted, so we give it back, or sorry, the, the T1 starts running again, does the read on A, and then write on A. And then now there's a context switch, where we switch back over now to T2, or T2 starts running. It tries to get the exclusive lock on A, but that, that's blocked because it's being held by T1. So then it waits, and then T1 can start running again, do the read on A that it wants to do, go ahead and unlock it, and then commit. And then now, the, uh, now when, the, when it's unlocked, T T1 gets, sorry, T2 gets the lock on A, it can go ahead and do the write, and then releases it. And again, now we don't have that uh, unrepeatable read problem that we had before. All right, it's pretty simple, but it's, it's, it's a really elegant solution that's, uh, uh, that you know, works again without having to see all the transaction queries ahead of time. So as I said, two-phase locking by itself is, is enough to guarantee that the uh, transactions or schedules will be, will be complex or realizable. Um, because any precedent graph for any transactions, uh, sequence of transactions is always going to be acyclic. I mean, there's not going to be uh, edges that could cause a cycle between them. But there is another issue that can, that can occur, uh, another problem that can occur that isn't a correctness issue, but rather it's a performance issue. Um, and that's called a cascading abort. So going back here, so now I'm going to do uh, in T1, I'm going to read on A, write on A, and then a read on B and write on B. But then at some later point, it's going to say it's going to go ahead and abort, right? So if T2 starts running uh, during this and gets the exclusive lock on A, which is allowed to do, because once T1 unlocks A, it's in the shrinking phase, so that's fine. So then T2 can grant that lock. Then it does the read on A. But at this point here, it's reading the write that T1 made. 
and then it has to stick around. And then at some point when T, T1 aborts, we actually have to also roll back T2 because we can't let T2 commit having seen the, the uncommitted change from T1, right? So a schedule like this would be permissible under two-phase locking, but when T2 goes to commit or any transaction that reads data from un, under another uncommitted transaction, you have to track the read, read and write set and you have to recognize this transaction read something from a transaction that has not committed yet. So when I go ahead and commit, I have to wait to find out whether that other transaction successfully committed before I'm allowed to commit. Right? Because the thing we want to avoid is, is having T2 leak any change that T1 made to the database leak to the outside world by allowing T2 to commit. Right? Because again, you would be able to see uh, see a change made to a, a, a to the database from a transaction that end up getting rolled back. The other problem also too is that any you know since, since now we need to pause or need to wait to see whether other transactions commit before our transaction is allowed to commit, then we have to then, if we identify that our transaction is going to abort because another transaction aborted, then we have to roll back any changes that we made. So now, in this case here, in T2, all the work that it did was running on the assumption that it would be allowed to commit, you know, because T read something from T1 and T1 is going to commit. We have to roll all that back, and now all that's wasted computation. So my example here, again, I'm only showing, you know, T2 doing a one read and one write. That's no big, big deal. But always think of extremes. Like if, if T2 did a billion reads and a billion writes and then has to end up getting aborted because it read a change from a transaction that it didn't commit, then that's, that's a lot of waste of work. And then the, the, the application, if it's written correctly, we have to resubmit that if they want it redone to you know, do all the work all over again. So the t with two-phase locking, there are potential be schedules that are serializable, but uh, we're not going to be able to always allow them uh, because, uh, because, you know, it, 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 uh, it would normally allow them because two-phase locking, is, again, it's a bit more conservative than maybe it necessarily needs to be. Um, but then we still have this problem where, again, we could have dirty reads because we're allowing transactions to keep running, but then when they commit, you got to wait to see whether anything they read from an uncommitted transaction, whether they have committed. I give these the, the dirty read, un unrepeatable read problem. So the solution to this will be a variant of two-phase locking called strong strict two-phase locking. I think the textbook might call them rigorous two-phase locking or other systems might call them rigorous, or rigorous two-phase locking, but they're essentially the same thing. And the basic idea here is we're gonna make a, a slight adjustment to two-phase locking to, to avoid this particular problem. So under strong strict two-phase locking, the way it works is that the growing phase, just like before, as, as I'm acquiring locks, right, the growing phase, the, the number of locks I'm holding goes up. But then now, there isn't really a switch into shrinking phase because you don't actually release any, any, any locks in a shrinking phase. It's only when the transaction commits, when the end of the transaction, then you release all the locks that you have, right? Because again, the idea here is you don't want anybody to have read, read something that you already did that you wrote. So therefore, I'm going to hold my exclusive lock on those objects that I wrote to until the very end. Then I commit, and then, then someone else can then read my changes. Because that, at that point, I know I've successfully saved my changes or committed. There's a, a slightly less um, conservative uh, version of, of this called strict two-phase locking, uh, where you just, you're allowed to release the read, uh, shared locks in the shrinking phase, but all the exclusive locks you hold at the very end. But under strong strict, you hold both shared and exclusive locks to the very, the very end of the transaction, right? So the way to think about this is that the, 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 so the formal definition of a schedule uh, that doesn't allow a other transaction to read or write data from another transaction until that other transaction has committed uh, would be termed as being a strict schedule, right? It's sort of the strict ordering of, of the operation so that we're not, uh, we're not modifying in-flight data or reading from uh, in-flight data. So the opposite benefit is that we avoid the cascading abort problem that I showed before. Um, and it actually simplifies, simplifies the implementation because now when, when a transaction aborts, since we know that no other transaction could have read data that we wrote to, uh, it makes rollback really easy because when, when my transaction aborts, I know I'm only at the rollback that one transaction because the, the, there's not, my data hasn't leaked to other in-flight transactions. Right? Whereas if you allow for cascading aborts have to handle them, then I could have a long dependency chain of what transaction read data from what transaction read data from what transaction. 
And then when I go to go ahead and abort, I've got to figure out all that out and, and roll them all back in the right order. So most systems, if they're going to do serializable, uh, if they're going to support serializable execution or serializable schedules or serializable isolation, and they're doing two-phase locking, they're going to give you strong, strict two-phase locking. And again, also, too, because there isn't actually an explicit unlock command like I'm showing my schedules. Like there isn't a SQL command that says unlock something. Uh, so there isn't a way to say, like, I, I, my, I know I'm not going to read this thing again or write it again, so I'll go ahead and release my locks now. So most systems will just give you, if you say I want serializable transactions, you get strong, strict two-phase locking by default. All right, so let's look at uh, uh, some other examples and how this all works together. So and say here now we have, we, it's similar to the banking example we saw last class. We have T1, uh, wants to move $100 out of my account into my bookies account. So debit $100 from, from account A and credit $100 to account B. And then for T2, they want to compute the, the sum of all the accounts, uh, the, 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 all the bank accounts and report it back to the, you know, to, to the application. Again, I'm showing this echo command here that there isn't a SQL command, there isn't anything like that. It's just a way to say, here's the return statement of the operation, of the transaction. So here's, the, here's how what happens if we execute these transactions without two-phase locking. So T1 would start, get the exclusive lock on A. T2 would start, would get the, try to get the share lock on A, but it can't because the T1 holds the exclusive lock. So it pauses and waits. T1 is allowed to read A, subtract $100 from it, and then write it back to the database. Now go ahead, goes ahead and unlocks A at which point the T2 gets the lock on A, and it goes ahead and read the value of A, so without A without the $100 that I took out. Unlocks A, takes the share lock on B before the uh, T1 can get the exclusive lock on B, so, so T2, sorry, T1 has to wait. T, T1, T2 is allowed to then read, read B, adds to the total, and produces the output, and then at which point T1 can then run again uh, and do the update on, on B. So if you look at the output of T2, it's going to be A plus B is going to equal 1900. So because we were able to read the, the, the value of A after taking $100 out, but then the value of B before putting that $100 back in, so now the bank is missing $100 here, right? Because we were able to get an interleaving of, of the transactions that wouldn't occur if they were running in serial order. So we do basic two-phase locking. T1 gets exclusive lock on A. T2 pauses when it's trying to get the share lock on A. That's fine. T1 gets the exclusive lock on B and then immediately release the uh, exclusive lock on A, at which point T2 can start running. Uh, and then when T2 then tries to get the, the shared lock on B, that gets stalled because T, T1 holds the lock on that. T1's allowed to then add the $100 to B, goes ahead and unlocks and commits it, and then at which point T2 can see the value B. So even though we're actually able to interleave the transactions. So while, uh, while T1 was doing the update on B, T2 was out of, allowed to read A after it was modified by, by T1. Um, but we're, again, we're, we're producing things in the right order and we come up with the, the, correct, uh, the correct number at the end. If you do strong, strict two-phase locking, uh, it's a, again, it, basically T2 tries to get the share lock on A, but it gets blocked until the very end that when T1 commits, because again, T1 is gonna hold the locks, that any locks that it acquires, to the very end to go ahead and commits. And then at this, this point here, you can, it's, it's, it's basically running it in serial order uh, and we're producing the correct result. So if we go back to that, the schedule that we uh, diagram we showed last time, where it sort of said this, this region of space here is saying this is all possible schedules you could have for, for transactions. And we said there was a small chunk of it, a subset of, the, of those schedules were the, the ones that were running in serial order. And then the ones around them were the ones that would be complex serializable and then runs around them could be view serializable. So any any schedule that's view serializable, uh, sorry, any schedule that's conflict serializable is implicitly also conflict ser view serializable, and any any schedule that's serial is is um, implicitly conflict serializable and view serializable. So now there's this region here for uh, no cascading aborts where some of those schedules are going to overlap with the, the serializable ones and the serial ones, but some of them are not going to be in that space. And then within that region, within conflict serializable, and also bounded within no cascading aborts, we would have the strong, strict uh, two-phase locking schedules. All right, so going back to the slide here, we've, we've talked about how to uh, handle the dirty read problems using strong, strict two-phase locking. So the next issue we gotta deal with is, is how to handle the deadlocks. And there's gonna be basically two approaches to this. Um, 
Deadlock detection is using a background thread to figure out, background worker to figure out when there's a deadlock and go ahead and try to break it. And then prevention is the idea is like, we're gonna ha order the way in which transactions are allowed to acquire locks in such a way that we, we guarantee that there won't, couldn't possibly be a deadlock. So we go back here, uh, we have a transaction T1 wants to take an exclusive lock on A and relock and take, do a read and then take exclusive lock on B. T2 wants to get a share lock on B, take, do a read on B and get a share lock on A. So in this case here, T1 starts, gets exclusive lock on A, that's fine. T2 starts, gets a share lock on B, that's fine. But then when it tries to get the share lock on A, it has to stall and wait. When T1 starts again, tries to get exclusive lock on B, it stalls and has to wait. And of course, this is your classic deadlock. So th this is the problem we're trying to avoid here, right? That, that transactions could be waiting to acquire locks that are being held by another transaction, but that other transaction is holding the lock that, that we hold, uh, and they're waiting for get a lock that we hold. Right? Classic, a classic OA level parallel programming deadlock. So it's essentially, again, a cycle of transactions that are waiting for locks to be released by another that are never going to get released because unless, unless, unless we do something. So as I said, there's going to be two approaches here. There'd be deadlock detection and deadlock prevention. And the, one of the main takeaways is that the enterprise systems, the high-end oracles and so forth, like systems cost a lot of money, they're actually going to implement both of these. And they will have uh, ways to toggle on one versus another based on the workload. And they're also going to maintain a bunch of additional statistics internally in the system to make better decisions of how, which one should you use. And then if you have to do deadlock detection, how, you know, what, what transaction should you kill and, and steal their locks from to give to the other transaction uh, in such a way that you can, you can minimize the amount of waste of work and, and, and improve your performance. But what, and we'll cover what those protocols, what those, those, those metrics are later on in a second. So with deadlock detection, the idea is here is that we're going to allow transactions to acquire locks as they need them or as they want them. And then there'll be a background worker that, that occasionally wakes up and looks at the uh, wait for graph which is basically keeping track of what lock, what transactions are waiting for what other transactions. And if it detects a cycle in that waits for a graph, it knows that it has to go ahead and, and choose a victim to, to kill, you know, take their wallet, take their car, take all their locks and give it to another transaction and allow, allow that transaction to run, right? And then of course now there's gonna be this trade-off between how aggressive we want our, this deadlock detection worker to run, right? If we run it every 60 seconds, then the overhead of checking the, 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 for cycles is pretty low, but I may, worst case scenario, have to wait 60 seconds before it can resolve a deadlock. But if I have my deadlock detector run every, every one nanosecond or one microsecond, then now I'm basically burning CPU cycles, checking for deadlocks over and over again, which I could have been using those resources to uh, execute queries and execute transactions. So again, what the right mix of how aggressive you want to be Depends on the workload, depends on the hardware, depends on a lot of different things that we've been talking about this entire semester. So let's look at some example like this. Uh, so again, the T1 wants to get a share lock on B, but that's being held by T2. T2 wants to get a share lock on, or exclusive lock on C, but that's being held by T3. And T3 wants to exclusive lock on A, but that's being held by T1. So again, in this example here, every time when one transaction is waiting for the lock for another transaction that waits for a graph, we introduce an edge. Then now we got to run our cycle detection algorithm, of which there are many. Pick your favorite, uh, and to decide which which one you want, you know how to break this. And so the way this typically works, since the since it's NP hard problem to find find these cycles, the they'll run a the, the Davis system will run a simple simple form where they maybe look for cycles between just two transactions, like transaction one is waiting for transaction T two and T two is waiting for T one. So you do a quick pass to find cycles to break. Uh, uh, really quickly using a, a, a quick heuristic algorithm, but then if you don't find any any uh, any cycles just through that simple detection, then you run the more expensive one uh, that takes a longer time. So that if you do that, then you can find some quick quick things, uh, some obvious things pretty quickly, um, and avoid having to run a really large uh, cycle detection algorithm uh, that's, that'd be more expensive. Again, don't, my example here, I have three transactions. In a high-end system, they could be executing hundreds of thousands of transactions a second. So in that environment, you, could, you, you know, you could have a huge graph with a huge number of cycles uh, with long edges, and it might take a while to actually find them. So you do the more expensive one only if you have to later on. So again, the background worker runs the deadlock detection algorithm uh, based on the, what we know in our, in our lock table and this lock manager. Again, this is why we want to have that centralized data structure. Then has to decide which one's going to be the victim to go ahead and kill and steal their 
uh, steal, steal their transaction to break the cycle. And so what will happen is the, the, when you identify the victim and you go ahead and abort it to break the cycle, depending how the transaction was invoked, you either have to send an exception back to the client and say, your transaction was killed, please restart it. Or if it's in the case of a store procedure, you could just actually just rerun it um, from the very beginning, um, just you know, invoke it as another RPC request and not have to alert the application. You can maybe do this a couple of times and then if it still gets aborted, then you, then you only throw back the exception in that case. So again, as we said before, there's, there's, a, there's a trade off between how aggressive you want to be for running deadlock detection versus how much time you want to spend you know, uh, you know, looking, for, looking, for, uh, looking for cycles versus letting transactions run. So now, how to pick your, your victim uh, is a very complicated thing. And this is what separates, again, the enterprise systems from the open source ones. Because um, there's a bunch of different things we consider uh, in, in our decision, and again, which may vary depending on the application needs. And the enterprise systems, you can tune these, these parameters to specify how you want uh, to pick deadlocked victims. So it could be something like, oh, I want to run this transaction, that is, uh, kill the transaction, that's the oldest. Like it's been running for five days, it might run for 500 days, I don't want to wait, let me just go ahead and kill it. Or you could say, pick the youngest one because the transaction just showed up, we'll go ahead and kill it, and then the application can then resubmit it right away. It could be by based on how many queries they've already executed so far. So I've, I've executed, say, a thousand queries. Maybe I'm less likely to go ahead and kill that versus a query that has run one query. Um, because if I roll back the thousand queries, they may have to resubmit that again. I have to do a thousand queries all over again. And that would be you know, a waste of resources to do that. It could be the number of items that they've already locked. So maybe I've only executed two queries, but I've acquired a billion locks for some reason. Getting all the, those locks in the lock manager are expensive, uh, so I don't want to have to waste that work. And so I'm better off killing another transaction that has less locks. Could be the, the number of times a transaction, uh, the, uh, the number of times you've rolled back a given transaction before. So if this transaction keeps getting rolled back over and over again, I may get so sympathetic and say, okay, well, I can't just keep killing this guy. I got to let him run at some point. So after a certain amount of time, you know, if you, if you can roll back 10 times, then the data system can say, okay, well, you've suffered enough. Uh, let me go ahead and let, let, you, uh, you know, let you run again. So there's, this is important because you, 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 wanna, you, know, you don't want to starve transactions. Actually, so the mistake I made was the, by the number of transactions to roll back with. Again, that's the cascading board thing. If we have to kill this transaction, but we know there's a thousand transactions that depend on what it wrote, so if I kill this one transaction to break, this, break the deadlock, I'll have to kill another th thousand transactions as well. Then that would be really expensive than just killing one transaction by itself. So again, like there's so many different factors you could account for all these things. Uh, and getting this right is like super hard to do. And this is, again, the enterprise systems can be a bit adaptive on this and, and try things out, learn from that, and, and get better over time. In some cases, they were just punted out to a, assume an experienced human is going to know how to set these things. And the last one I was just saying is what I said before, like, if we know the transaction has been started a ton of times, we don't want to have it burn cycles. Uh, you know, we want to be sympathetic and say, okay, well, you've, 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 gone, you've been restarted enough. You can go ahead and run. All right, so now the question is, how far do you want to roll back? And so the most simplistic thing to do is say, just roll back everything that, that the, the transaction has done and start it from the beginning. Or, you know, punt it back to the application and say, restart it if you want to run it again. Um, there are, in some cases, where you can run, roll back to, do partial rollbacks to save points. Think of this as like a, a marker in the life of a transaction. You, like, you give it like a name or a number and you say, I've done a bunch of work and it, here's, now here's a save point and then the transaction keeps on running. So now though, if there's a deadlock, I can roll back partially the changes back to that last save point and then resubmit things all over again. Um, you typically only want to do this uh, if you typically want to do this if, you, uh, if you're running these as, like, store procedures because you, you don't know whether it's application logic where like given some output, uh, you know, given some result of a query, have an if clause that you know, maybe runs one query if, if it's this, if it's another query if that. If without that logic running that system, you, you may do the wrong thing. Um, but you can do partial rollbacks and, and still or end up with a serialized ordering in some cases. All right, so that's deadlock detection, right? There's a background thread running to figure out what, what to go ahead and kill. The alternative is to do deadlock uh, prevention. And the idea is that when a transaction goes to request a lock, you decide at that moment, are you allowed to take this lock or not? 
Uh, and if it's being held by somebody else, you decide, okay, am I allowed to wait for the lock? Or do I, am I allowed to go kill the other guy, take their wallet, take their locks? Or do I commit suicide and kill myself? Because I, if I, I can't wait, right? So in this approach, we don't require the background worker. We don't need that wait for graph. Uh, we're not looking for cycles because again, cycles aren't going to be able to occur because in the way in which we order the requests and what transactions allow to wait for other transactions, we can guarantee that we're not going to have uh, any deadlocks. So for this, we're going to assume that the, the order transaction, the one with the order timestamp, is going to have a higher priority. Um, so we just assume transactions are assigned timestamps when they, when they show up, and the order that you are potentially the, the, the higher priority. And so the two variants of this deadlock prevention algorithm are going to be wait and die and wound and wait. And again, the way to think about this is going to be what age of a transaction is a, uh, if you have the age of one transaction and the age of another transaction, they're never going to be equal because otherwise they'd, they'd be the same transaction. Then the protocol specifies if I'm younger than them, what do I do? If they're older, if I'm older than them, what am I allowed to do? And so in wait and die, the idea is that the old is allowed to wait for the young. So if a requesting transaction comes along and they have a higher priority than the holding transaction, um, meaning the other transaction is older, then we're allowed to wait for, for that transaction to, to, to release the lock and then, then we go and acquire and get into what you want. Otherwise, if we're younger than them, then we, we have to go kill ourselves because we, we are not allowed to wait. Wound to wait is the opposite. The young is allowed to wait for the old. So if the requesting transaction has a higher priority than the holding transaction, then the holding transaction has to abort. Uh, you're allowed to shoot that other transaction, kill them, and abort them, and then take, take their lock and release it. Otherwise, you go ahead and wait. So looking at real simple example, two examples like this. So T1 starts in the top here. Uh, T1 is going to have a, a older timestamp than T2, like one is less than two. So at the very beginning, T1 starts, then T2 starts, then T2 gets exclusive lock on A, then T1 wants to acquire that exclusive lock on A. And then now, depending on the, what protocol we're using, uh, if, if it's wait and die, old waits for young, then since T1 is older, it's allowed to wait for T2 since T2 is younger. Uh, or under wound and wait, which is young waits for old, in that case, uh, T1 is allowed to shoot T, T2, uh, cause them to abort, and then take, take their locks. And then down here at the bottom, it's, it's the opposite. T1 starts, it gets the suicide lock on A. T2 wants to acquire the lock, that lock on T1. On our wait and die, which is the old race for young, T2 has to abort because T1 is older than T2. The young are not allowed to wait for the old on our wait die, so T2 has to just give up and abort and kill themselves. In wound and wait, since the young is allowed to wait for old, uh, T2 can wait for T T1 to release the lock and then, it, then go ahead and acquire and do it at once. So why does this work? Why does it, why can we guarantee that there's no deadlocks? Well, in the same way that we talked about with in the B plus tree when we were doing uh, latching, ignoring the sibling pointers, where we had transactions only acquiring latches in one direction, like from the top of the B plus tree down to the bottom, we weren't having anybody coming up from the bottom to the top. Right? This guarantees that you know under wait and die, we'd wait since all of the 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 weights of to acquire latches are going or locks are going in one direction. We don't have anybody going in the other direction. There can't be a, any deadlocks. So now when a transaction restarts, um, to prevent it from getting uh, starved for resources, if a transaction gets aborted, when it gets restarted, it uses the same timestamp that it had before. And then that guarantees that it's not just given a new timestamp over and over again, and therefore it may try to acquire locks over and over again and not be able to get them and, and get killed off. So eventually it'll be the oldest person there, the oldest transaction in the, uh, you know, in, in the system. So depending on the protocol, it could, it'll be able to get the, the locks that it needed once right away, or it's allowed to wait for it to get the acquired locks that it needed and not have to abort. All right, so everything we talked about so far have, has been about assuming that, that for, for one lock, it goes to one object. And again, I've been being vague. I haven't said what we're locking. I said they're database objects. You can kind of assume that they're, they're like tuples, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. It could have been a database, could have been a table. It doesn't matter. And so the challenge with this, this approach, one-to-one uh, -one mapping between the object we're trying to, you know, for a lock and an object, the problem with this is that if we have to acquire a lot of locks, then that's expensive. Again, going to the lock manager 
is 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 not like trying to acquire a latch because I I gotta take the latches to get into the lock manager table, and then I may have to go go read some data, update a queue and so forth. Right, that's a very expensive to do. So if I have to do that for a, a billion times for a billion tuples, that's gonna be really expensive. And so we're willing to make that trade off because again the if in the transaction world the 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 work we're doing for on an object we the locks for, that could be, you know, could be milliseconds, could be seconds, could be hours, days in some cases. And so it's okay to pay that penalty to have to go maintain the, go update the lock information. But again, we want to avoid maybe in the common case having to do that excessively. So this is why we're going to introduce uh, now hierarchical locking through lock grant and different lock granularities. So now when a transaction wants to acquire a lock, and we can decide at what scope, what granularity it wants to acquire that lock for to try to balance the, uh, the need to, 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 or balance the acquiring as many locks that it, that it absolutely needs uh, versus maximizing the amount of parallelism in one. So there's this trade-off between I can take very coarse grain locks and therefore I only have to go to the lock manager a small number of times, but then that blocks anybody else from running in my system. Right? When MongoDB was first uh, came out, they had a single lock for the entire database. That means nobody could read and write to the, the database while somebody was updating even one tuple, even though it may be updating other parts of the database that wouldn't be affected by that. So that's really easy to implement because it's a single lock, but they, you get terrible parallelism because now you're, everyone's blocked behind uh, a single writer. Okay, it gives me this trade-off between trying to acquire the fewest locks that we need, but also balance the 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 granularity of those locks so that we can still get good parallelism. So the way to think about this is now your database is, 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 is represented in a hierarchy. So you, you have a database at the top and the database is comprised of tables. Tables are comprised of pages uh, or groupings of row groups or groupings of, 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 of tuples. And then within those tuples, we can have uh, multiple attributes. So now when T1 comes along you know, and it gets a lock, say, on, on a table, that implicitly locks everything below it in the hierarchy from all, all its descendants from that, that node in the, in the tree. So if I get a lock on, on the table, I'm implicitly locking all the things down below because everyone has to come through that same hierarchy when I want to acquire locks, has to go in, the, in, in follow the same protocol and go in the same order that we saw before. So in terms of how these things are, how, how, how common are these, these the different kind of lock hierarchies are implemented, the most common ones would be locks on tables and locks on tuples. Uh, Locks on pages are probably uh, the next most common thing, but not all systems actually implement them. Uh, locking databases are, some systems will do that if you're doing DMLs or, or D, sorry, uh, DDLs and make changes to the schema, but it's, 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 it's not as common as like locking tables and tuples. And then super rare is being, having sort of really fine grained locks on, on individual attributes or individual columns. Uh, the only system I actually know that can do that, that know that does this is um, is Yugabyte, right? They have a case, they have an example where like you could uh, instead of you try to clock the lock on tuple and you recognize you're only updating a you know some small set of attributes, you can convert that actually down into a to lock on the on the columns. Again, that can try to maximize the amount of parallelism in the system in that case. All right, so now now we're going to introduce additional lock modes because uh, now we're going to have this hierarchy because it may be the case that. If we have to go acquire locks in this hierarchy uh, at the upper levels in the system, maybe you know if we have to update a, a single tuple, we don't want to acquire exclusive lock from the entire database, entire table, or you know a, a group a group of tuples. And so, but we still want to have a a way to provide hints to other transactions that may be trying to do uh, do other types of locking in the hierarchy about what's going on down below without explicitly having to record everything. So this is where these new intention locks are going to come in. And the idea, again, these are hints uh, at a higher level node in this hierarchy to, to instruct or tell the other transactions in, that you're taking things in a shared exclusive mode at, at lower parts of, of the tree. So the idea is that the intention locks tell you that somewhere down below, I, I have something in explicit locking mode, but I have sort of this, this fuzzy intention locks up above. And again, it's just, just, uh, just for hints. So the, the three types of intention locks are intention shared, attention exclusive, and shared attention exclusive. So attention shared is saying that I'm, I'm giving you a hint to say at some lower point in the hierarchy, I'm taking something with an explicit 
uh, explicit shared lock. Tension exclusive is the opposite of saying someone below me, I'm taking something in an explicit ex exclusive lock. And that prevents someone from getting from taking incompatible locks that may be trying to read the whole, all the tuples, but you know you need to update one of them. So the intention exclusive can block them from doing that. Shared intention exclusive is really two locks put together. So it's, it's the regular shared lock that we talked about before, but then also an intention exclusive lock. And so you would do this to say like, I want to be able to read everything below me in, and read that in, in a shared mode lock, but I'm also going to be updating a subset of potentially or, or some number of, of those of, of objects below me in the hierarchy in exclusive mode, but I have not taken the whole thing as, as an exclusive lock. So again, it's a way to introduce additional amount of parallelism, but still have the hinting capability uh, somewhere in between a shared, you know, a, a shared lock or attention exclusive lock and, and, a, and a, sorry, a shared lock and exclusive lock. It's someone to say like, it's a shared lock, but also like I'm modifying some things. So I'm not going to go through the, the, the matrix like this, but you can start to see it gets, it gets more complicated. Again, the the intention shared is pretty much compatible with everything except for uh, exclusive lock, exclusive mode locks. Um, if you have exclusive mode that blocks everything. But then as you as you sort of have higher levels of intention or shared intention, um, then then you know it becomes more restrictive what you can do. So the protocol is going to work like this. It's the same thing as that two-phase locking that I said before. So it's still going to have the growing phase and the shrinking phase, right? Whether you're using strong, strict, or, or regular two-phase locking, all that's going to be the same. So now what's going to happen, though, is that we have to traverse that hierarchy, and we, we want to acquire, try to decide what's the appropriate lock to acquire at some given level of the hierarchy. And usually you try to take... Uh, intention locks as, as far as you can until you get the very bottom where it, you, then you get, actually get the, the explicit locks of the things you want. But it may be the case that as you're going down, you recognize uh, that maybe I took something at a higher level in, a, in an intention mode lock, and you realize that was a mistake. I just want to go back and, and go explicitly convert it into a shared and exclusive lock. And so you, you can go back up the hierarchy and, and ask, or upgrade a lock type if you recognize that things aren't going the way you thought they were going to go. So the, you can start to see why the, now we have all these different objects we want to acquire locks on, and we have all these different lock modes we could have. Um, this is why the, the lock manager, the lock table itself, isn't going to be a regular table, because if you think about it, if I have a, a billion tuples, I want a billion entries in my lock table for, uh, you know, for any possible lock I'm going to take on those tuples. Instead, the, the lock table is meant to be a dynamic where I can... If I recognize that no one has a lock on something anymore, I could go ahead and delete it to free up space. Right? Or if I bulk load a billion tuples, but I only lock 100 of them for my transactions, then I don't, I'm not wasting space in my lock table for, you know, for all those tuples that no one's ever going to run in, in context of a transaction. All right, so let's look at the uh, first example here. Um, and we're going to be doing a getting the balance of my bank account and then also increase, the, uh, <clears throat> increase my bookie's bank account uh, compute interest on it by, by 1%. Now the question is what locks we're going to want to obtain. So for all the leaf nodes, those you have to acquire in explicit mode. So either shared mode or uh, exclusive mode. Um, but then the higher level, uh, we're going to try to acquire things in intention locks. But we recognize in some cases it makes sense to go back and put it into explicit mode. We, we can go ahead and do that. So for simplicity, I'm not going to show uh, attribute level locks or... Um, page locks or, or data locks, which is to keep it simple and do a two-level hierarchy. So T1 starts, I'm going to read the record on A. So what it wants to do is figure out how to get through the table to find the tuple that is down here that it wants to read. So the question is, what lock do we want to acquire at the table level before we acquire the shared lock down below? So in this case here, we can say, we can do an attention shared lock and say, hey, down below me in this table, I'm taking one of these tuples, or one or more of these tuples in shared mode. I don't know what they are at this point. I don't need to record that in the higher level of the hierarchy. It's just a hint to say, if you're coming down through the hierarchy, uh, be aware that I have something down below in, in shared mode. And that might be incompatible with somebody else coming along later, uh, later on. So once I have the intention shared lock on the, on the table, then I can go ahead and get the shared lock uh, on, on the tuple and go ahead and do my read. Now, in the case of T2, it wants to update the bank account record. So now we've got to look at the compatibility matrix and say, what lock should we take on the table, table level before we take the exclusive lock on 
the, the tuple down below. So in this case here, we want an intention share, or sorry, intention exclusive, because that's going to be a hint to say, again, it's somewhere in this table. I'm, I'm, I'm taking a tuple in exclusive mode. I don't know where, but just be aware that this is happening. And so it turns out now, it, uh, according to the compatibility matrix, intention shared is compatible with intention exclusive. So both transactions can hold uh, different locks on the same object at the same time that are compatible. So again, now we need to keep track of what mode, what locks are being held for a given object, could be one or more, and what modes they're actually in. All right, so let's look at a more complicated example. We have three transactions running. T1 wants to read all the tuples in R and then update one of them. T2 wants to read a single tuple in R, and then T3 wants to just read all the tuples in R. So when T1 starts, again, we gotta go through the hierarchy, and again, it wants to read all the tuples, but one of them is gonna do a read followed by a write. So in this case here, we wanna get a shared intention exclusive lock. So what this is gonna do for us is that the shared portion of this SIX lock gets all the tuples uh, at, at the leaf nodes in the hierarchy in shared mode automatically because we have the table locked in shared mode. But then there's also an additional hint to say, hey, down below, one of these tuples is gonna be locked in exclusive mode. I don't know which one it is, again, but like that's enough at the, the high level hierarchy to tell you that there's something going on down below that does this. So now T2 comes along and, and wants to read this one tuple down here. It's not the one that's being held in exclusive mode. So in theory, we should be able to allow these two transactions to run simultaneously at the same time. So again, looking at a compatibility matrix, the, we can see that we can take an intention shared lock on the root node, and that's compatible with the shared intention exclusive mode. Um, and then down below, it can then take the shared lock on tuple one, right, and go ahead and read it. Now, if you try to read the tuple that was being modified by T1, well, the exclusive lock is obviously incompatible with the shared lock, so it would have to stall and wait for that. And depending on we're doing deadlock detection or uh, but wait and die, we'd wait. We have to decide how to resolve that at some point. But in our example here, it worked out just fine. So now when T3 starts, it wants to scan all the tuples in R down below. So to do this, it wants to get the, the shared lock uh, on something down below, but the, say it wants to get the shared lock on the, on, the, on the table, that's not compatible with shared intention exclusive and, and uh, being held by T1, so therefore it has to stall and wait. Right? So then now when T, T, T1 and T2 and T1 finish, uh, then now T3 can go ahead and get the shared lock on, on, on the table R, and now go ahead and, and can scan and read everything. So as, as I said before, we, we, we can support lock escalation. So if we recognize that, we th the data system can recognize that I, I'm acquiring a lot of locks at this lower level explicitly, then it might be better off to just go back up the hierarchy and escalate the lock I have up there to put into an explicit mode. So I then get all the locks without having to have you know, every, an entry for every single one of them inside of my lock table. Right? And this reduces the number of times I have to go to lock manager, which I have to protect with latches just as, as, as if it was my page table or any other data structure in the system. So now that you know, if I'm going back in and out of the lock manager over and over again, then there's gonna be tension on those latches, which would uh, slow things down. All right, so as I said, the, in, in practice, uh, you typically don't specify, I want I want to acquire a lock or unlock things. Um, right? Again, when you run a select query, you run an update, insert update lead query, right? the, the data system will automatically acquire the locks you need uh, in the right mode for you automatically. Um, but there may be in some cases where you actually want to give hints to the database system and tell it about how you plan to use data or use objects in the database uh, so that it can override maybe what lock would normally uh, try to acquire for you and put it in the mode that you know is gonna help you later on. It's like a hint to say, here's what's gonna happen later on in my transaction. Do acquire locks in this way for me and that'll make things better for us uh, l later on. Uh, you can acquire exclusive locks on, on databases. Uh, we'll see an example in, in, in class next time on of these advisory locks in Postgres, like they're these unnamed or these named objects you can acquire locks on, um, and you can do certain things. Like you can, in some systems, acquire explicit locks on things, but most applications aren't written that way. So let me look at two two examples of doing hints. So the first to do select for update. 
So, so again, when, when you run a select query, the data system will automatically lock any object you're reading into sh shared mode. But again, a, a very common pattern is to do read, modify, write. And you saw this example of like my, my transferring money in the bank account. I had to read the record first, then I modified it, and then wrote it back to the data to the new value. So in that scenario, if I, if I was just doing the shared lock when I did the first select, I then had to go back into the lock manager and then, and then upgrade my lock to an exclusive, uh, exclusive mode when the, the update query comes, the right query comes. So instead, I can add this modifier to my select queries. I add this for update keyword at the end. So now when I run the query, it says, run this select, produce the result as a normal select would. But when you acquire locks on anything, don't acquire it in shared mode, acquire it for in, in exclusive mode, because I'm going to go ahead and update it later on. So, you're, so and that forces the system to acquire the, the locks in write mode or uh, exclusive mode at the moment it tries to acquire them and, and reads them, because you know you're going to update things later on. And in this, this, um, this screenshot here from the Postgres uh, documentation, you can see there's a bunch of different variations for this. Um, you can set shared locks and do selects for, you know, select for share, which is uh, the idea is there. You, if you're not running with serializable isolation, you're running a low isolation level, it forces transaction level locks uh, maybe longer than they normally would at a lower isolation level. Um, Postgres and MySQL this, and, but select for update is very common. Most systems actually support this. Another one that's kind of cool is called select skip locked. And so the idea here is that I can perform a select query, but instead of waiting around to acquire locks on any data that I may want to read from my select, I can tell the data system just, just ignore it, just skip anything that's, that's locked in a lock, that's already locked and I can't get it, right? So as, again, think of like a sequential scan, if I'm scanning and another transaction is updating data at the same time, when I do that scan and it sees that uh, it sees that that the, the tuple is locked with my uh, skip locked modifier, I just go ahead and skip it. So then may, may you say, well, how is this actually useful? Why would anyone actually do this? So a common design pattern is actually to put a to use a data system for as a queue. So you could have a table. Where here's all the the tasks that I'm putting into the queue, and you could have a bunch of workers pulling the the, the, the most recent entry to, to pop out to, to process and work. So in that case, the way it would work is that you would have a transaction start, read the table, pull out the first one, essentially delete it, or mark it as being uh, completed, and then go ahead and commit. But now another worker may come along and try to wants to get the next task to do, but it doesn't actually want the very first one, but that's, that's already being held by another transaction. It just can skip that one's locked and pick, pick the next one, right? So it, it's, kind of, it's kind of a cool idea it just starts to leak the abstraction to transactions into the application, which you, you could argue is a good idea or a bad idea. Um, uh, I, I, I think it's cool because, again, I, I like transactions. And it's, 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 a, uh, it's a different variation to try to do, you know, different variations on a, the basic protocol to handle different application scenarios. Um, so I think it's worth pursuing. All right, so to finish up. Uh, Two-phase locking is used almost in every single data system. We'll see next class, Optimus Concurrent Control, uh, which is uh, uh, not as common. Um, Two-phase locking is, is, in, is in most systems that, that you can think of, um, but uh, OCC is still really important and used in other systems. And again, what two-phase locking at its core is doing is it's, it's generating, it's automatically generating interleaving of transactions that can guarantee things that are uh, scheduled that are complex serializable. In the case of using strong strict 2PL, it can guarantee that you don't have any cascading aborts. We said to halt, we, we looked at a handle deadlocks either through detection mechanisms or prevention protocols. Um, there's a bunch of other aspects of transactions that we haven't talked about. We can talk about later on, like nested transactions. We talked a little bit about save points. Uh, there's there's multi-node transactions that we'll, or distributed transactions we'll cover when we talk about distributed databases later in the semester. Like transactions are super cool. It's a super hard problem. It's really hard to get right. As I said, it's the second hardest thing after query optimization. Um, but you know, it's, it's a really fascinating topic and people are still trying to make these things faster even, even today. All right. So next class, again, as I said, we'll talk about timestamp ordering or optimistic concurrent show protocols. And then we'll also finish up talking about, uh, variations, isolation levels and additional anomalies that we haven't talked about so far. Okay. 
Mmm, I need something refreshing when I get finished manifesting. Too cold, a whole bowl like Smith and Wesson. One court and my thoughts hip hop related. Write a rhyme and my pen's intoxicated. Lyrics are quicker with a sip of more liquor. Since I'm a city slicker, playing waves are quicker. Rhymes I create rotate at a rate too quick to duplicate. Feel a breeze as a skate. Mics at Fahrenheit when I hold it real tight. When I'm in flight, then we ignite. Blood starts to boil. I heat up the party for you. Let my girl rub me and my mic down with oil. Records still turn with third degree burn for one man. I heat up your brain, give it a suntan. So just cool, let the temperature rise to cool it off with St. Ives. 